All right, when you see this, do you get stressed out like I do? Exactly, you do. This is the worst part of traveling, is when you, especially living here. Let's, this, I think this is 81. If it's not 81, it's 95. I mean, it's just like, it's the worst thing where you're, you know, you're cruising, you're making great time. The GPS is saying, yeah, you're going to get to your destination. You can't wait to get to the beach or to the mountain or to the airport, wherever you're going, or to grandma's house. And then you go over that hill, and then you see this. Or you see, or worse, you do the curve, and you start seeing the brake lights, and you're just like, oh, no. What is it, and how long and I'm going to be here? Why is it so irritating? Because it's forcing us to wait. And waiting can be very annoying. If you don't, if this doesn't resonate with you, think about the grocery store. And it's not as much now with self-checkout, but remember when you know you go to the checkout lane and you see, oh, they've got three lanes open. And as you're approaching, you're like, which one is the shortest? Which one is going to cause me to wait the least? And then you get in that line, and then, I don't know if you do this, don't you keep checking the other lines just to see if you're right? Be like, hey, uh, hey, uh, I think I'm beating them. Oh, I was at, I think I'm beating them. I'm beating, oh, they got in front of me. What, do you not know how to fill out a check? Let's get this moving. <laughs> Waiting is difficult. And what we've been talking about, the church, we are waiting. We're waiting on Jesus to come back. And we've been looking at 2 Peter. That's where we're going to be today. We're going to finish the book of 2 Peter. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them and join us reading there. If you don't, don't worry. The scripture will be on the screen. Last week, we were at the beginning of 2 Peter 3, and that's when Peter was describing the end of the world and how quickly and sudden it's going to come when Jesus comes back. But knowing about the end of the world is only helpful if we know how to live how God wants us to while we wait. So let's look at how Peter ends this letter. We're going to start in verse 11. Since all these things, he's talking about the cosmos, the earth, the heavens, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, and there's that word again that literally means melt away, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, remember beloved is that term of affection. Since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him, by God, by Jesus, without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in those letters that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people, and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And I would be remiss if I don't point out, both now and to the day of eternity, that's the only time that phrase is used in the entire Bible. It's very unique to Peter. Um, But the rest of this passage, I think, is pretty clear. Peter asks a question, and then he answers it. The question is, what type of people should we be while we're waiting for Jesus to come back? And the answer is not surprising. We should be people that pursue holiness. Our follow-up question is, what does that look like for us day to day? Is it someone who never has any fun, someone who never experiences any pleasure? By no means. A lifestyle of don'ts, don't do this, don't do that. A lifestyle of don'ts, that's how the Pharisees lived. The legalistic, moralistic Pharisees. 
We should live a lifestyle of do's, but our do's must be based on God's word. And there's two do's in this passage. We should train and we should grow. Now, those are very closely related. This is just a little nuance of how they're different, but we're going to look at both of these. Verse 14 has the first do. Make every effort. That phrase right there, make every effort, that's where the word training, it's the same word in Greek. Train to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. So we know that we're supposed to be training, but what is our workout plan? Well, it says we're, we're supposed to be spotless, blameless, at peace with God. Now, you read this, and you're like, spotless and blameless, what does that mean? Does that mean I have to be a perfect person? Of course not. There are no perfect people. And trying to be a perfect person will just frustrate you. Spotless and blameless are Old Testament phrases. And in the context of the Old Testament, it's very clear it's impossible to be perfect. These phrases refer to the lamb, the spotless lamb, that would be offered as a sacrifice to take away the sins of the people. And we know that the Old Testament picture of the spotless lamb is pointing us forward to what Jesus is going to do. And in the New Testament, Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9 specifically tells us, so there's no doubt, that Jesus is the ultimate spotless lamb that we've all been waiting for. Because when he is sacrificed, he's going to take away all the sins of humanity. Jesus was the only perfect person. That's why he was the only one that could pay the price, the high price, to redeem us. Because remember, redeem literally means to purchase, to buy back. It would refer to to free slaves. So when the New Testament uses spotless and blameless, It's obviously referring to someone who is redeemed by Jesus. Those of us purchased by Jesus' blood, what 1 Peter uh, Peter refers to in 1 Peter as the, the imperishable blood of Jesus, meaning it's the most valuable commodity in all the universe, someone who is saved. So positionally, we are saved. We change. We cross over from death to life. And that is the only way, in that moment when we completely change, we become a new person, we're found in Jesus, that's the only way we can experience peace with God. If we're found in Christ, that means we can look forward to Jesus coming back in eager anticipation, whereas everybody else, the wicked, those without Jesus, is something to be afraid of. It's something to be feared when Jesus comes back because they are going to experience God's wrath, whereas we, those of us redeemed in Christ, will experience peace and joy. But the question then is, how do you train to be blameless and spotless? Because that's what Peter is telling us to do. Well, Peter mentions Paul in this session. And I'm going to quote some Paul to show you how aligned they are with their teachings. Um, They couldn't be more different as people, but their teachings were the same because they were both being inspired by the Holy Spirit. They both teach us that one way we train ourselves to be blameless and spotless is to focus on the second coming of Jesus. You got to keep your eye on the ball. You got to keep your goal in place. That is what we're working towards. This is Peter's version. This whole part of this chapter is Peter's version. So let's read Paul's version. Paul's version is in Titus 2. Now this is just one example of Paul talking about (coughs) focusing on Jesus coming back. This is what Scripture says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. See that? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. This present age, while we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So they're both telling us, Jesus is coming back. How are we supposed to live? Is both saying that we 
should have a lifestyle that does not look like the world we live in. It, we should be different. Our lifestyle should look like the world that is coming when Jesus comes back. And what does that world look like? That world is where holiness is going to reign. So we need to pursue holiness. Or like Paul says in Philippians 2, be blameless. He's using the same word. Be blameless children of God. So that, why? So that you can shine as you live alongside a dark and wicked, corrupt generation. And I want to be clear, this does not come naturally. Because we are still weighed down because we live in a broken world. We still battle our sinful desires. And so we, that's why we have to be intentional with our training to pursue holiness. Because think about it like this. We are reborn in Christ, right? We're born again. You've heard that terminology. We're, born, we're reborn in Christ. So we need to think about ourselves like we would a baby. A baby's born, and then what happens? The baby learns how to cry. They know that immediately. The baby learns how to eat. The baby eventually learns how to sleep. That's right, new parents. Eventually that baby will sleep. The baby eventually learns how to talk. The baby eventually learns how to walk, and so on and so forth. And that's basically what he's saying we do. We, as new babies in Christ, we need to go through the same thing. We need to learn how to eat. To start with, we need to just snorkel on the surface of the water of the gospel. But then as we grow, we need to dive deeper and scuba dive into the depths of the gospel truth. That's why there's that one passage where he says, you know, you should be eating meat, but you're still drinking milk. What's up with you? Because you're not being intentional with your training. We also need to learn how to walk. How? Walk in holiness. Because you need to understand, neither Paul nor Peter assume that the salvation we receive when we're positionally safe is going to automatically produce godliness. That's not what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament teaches that we have, that we will train ourselves, we will grow, and we will change and become more and more like Jesus. So think about when, I, when you see this word training, think about it as gradual, gradual progression toward being more like Jesus. And what's Jesus like? What's Jesus like? He's blameless. He's spotless. He's holy. In 1 Peter, God commands us. It's, very, it's right before the passage that Josh re, uh, read, and we didn't plan that. In 1 Peter, God commands us what? To be holy. Why? Because I am holy. You're my people. You're my children. You belong to me. You should talk like your parent. How do your kids learn to talk? Listening to us. And so they talk like us. How do your kids learn to walk? By you doing this, Right? And so he's saying the same thing. You need to learn to talk like me and walk like me. God, why? Because God cannot negotiate with the holiness of his own being. What do I mean by that? His holiness, God's holiness, does not allow him to overlook sin. He's not going to just turn a blind eye to your sin to somehow prove that he really loves you. No more than a parent would do that if their baby, their young child, their toddler, their teenager is about to do something that's going to hurt themselves. What do you do? You stop them. Same thing. We don't just let the kid burn their hand on the stove and be like, hey, does that prove I really love you because you really wanted to touch that stove? No, we stop them. God's doing the same thing. He's, like, he's saying, I want to stop you. I can't tolerate sin. It's because he loves us that he wants us to avoid sin. Why? Because he knows that sin will eventually destroy each and every one of us. And so as we train, as we grow, we need to get into the habit of mourning, mourning our sin. I don't think enough of us take our sin seriously enough. I think too many of us try to rationalize our sin. But we cannot treat our sin as insignificant. Why? Because God cannot treat our sin insignificant. 
And if you want to know how serious sin is, look at the cross. How do you know how, how much something is worth? Well, you look at the price that was paid. What price was paid to take away the sin of the world? The perfect, blameless, spotless Son of God who left the throne of heaven and lived perfectly as one of us. Perfectly. He never sinned. He never, said, he never got mad unjustly. He never had a wicked thought. He never treated somebody with disrespect. He always put up with annoying people. He lived perfectly. And then he died on the cross. That's how much sin costs God. For him to die in our place. For his perfect son to die instead of us. So he cannot take sin lightly. And we shouldn't either. And I said it last week, and it's just, I'll repeat it because apparently, based on the feedback I got, a lot of you need to hear this, and I need to hear it too. I need to remind myself that when we continue doing things that we know are sinful, we are mocking God. It's that simple. We are mocking him and his grace. And we're going to talk more about that at the beginning of July, but we cannot take his grace for granted. Living like the world, living like this world that we're surrounded by, makes no sense for the Christian. We should not look anything like this world. Why? Because we know, because of Scripture, what's going to happen to this world. It's going to burn away. It's going to pass. Why do we want to live like it? It makes no logical sense for us to think that that's how we're supposed to live when we know that it's going to pass away. Which brings us to do number two, grow. We see this in verses 17 and 18, and I'm going to paraphrase it right here. Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Why? So that you are not led astray. Another translation or another part of this passage says, so that you do not become unstable, so that you don't lose your stability. The stability is talking about standing firm. It's the whole theme of our VBS, Breaker Rock Beach. Did you listen to what the video said? We live in a world of shifting sands, where there is no truth, where everything is relative, where there's so many mixed messages that people are brainwashing kids with. And the whole purpose of Breaker Rock Beach is to show you that, no, in all this sand, there is a solid rock, a solid foundation that you can stand on. And his name is Jesus Christ. And so that's what it's talking about with stability. He's saying, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus so that you do not sink in the sand so that you are not led astray. Because here's the thing you need to remember. Peter knows firsthand how it feels to be led astray. He knows what it means, what it feels like to be unstable. Remember, Peter was called out by Paul for being a hypocrite. Do you remember this story? Here's what happened. Peter, in Acts 10 and 11, Peter receives this vision from God telling him that the Gentiles can now be saved. So go take the gospel message to the Gentiles. Go share the gospel with those people. And at the time, other church leaders, they were appalled. And they criticized Peter for trying to reach those people with the gospel, those disgusting people with the gospel. And to Peter's credit, he stood strong. He did not budge. He did not lose his stability. He said, no, God told me to do this. Jesus died for them too. They're made in God's image. I'm going to go tell them the gospel. Peter stood strong until he didn't. Because Galatians 2.13 tells us that at some point later, At some later time, Peter and all the other church leaders, even Barnabas, were led astray and were ostracizing Gentile believers. And Paul calls them out on it. This proves how easy it is for Christians, even Christian leaders, to be led astray. Paul called them out, and Peter, Barnabas, they all repented. And Peter now is warning us, and he's, this is the message he's saying, 
Just because you stand firm today does not guarantee that you're going to stand firm tomorrow unless you continue to saturate your mind with Scripture. See, the only way to stand strong is to cling to God's Word. That's how we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. The grace of God has saved us, no doubt. But it's that same grace that enables us to say no to sinful desires. It's that same grace that empowers us to pursue holiness. And what is that grace? That grace is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God. And that Holy Spirit, that grace allows us to become more and more like Jesus. And I alluded to this earlier. I'm going to bring it up again right here. There are many of us sitting here today or listening online. There are many of us who've been saved for years, maybe even decades. But we've grown very little. We've grown very little in the grace of Jesus and the knowledge of God. Why? Why? Because for too long, we have been passive. For too long, we have been complacent. And any coach will tell you, we've been talking about training, any coach will tell you this, if you're passive, if you're complacent, you're not going to win. You're not going to win if that's your mindset. But that's been our mindset. We continue to just drink milk, to just along the surface, instead of diving deep to learn to eat that meat, the difficulties of Scripture. And I'll tell you this, I don't know why it happened, but I know this, that type of Christianity where you get saved and then you sit passively and you never do anything, you never change, you never grow, that type of Christianity is not what the New Testament describes. That type of Christianity would be completely alien, completely foreign to Peter and Paul. They would not recognize that type of Christianity. And that's what Peter's been writing this entire letter about. Watch out for false teachers that tell you one thing and lead you astray. So if we want to know what does it look like for a Christian to grow in grace, well, just read Galatians 5, 22 through 23. It says that we're talking about the Spirit is the grace. The fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is that what you're seeing in the world when you turn your TV and walk through these doors? No, the world can't do that because these are the fruits of the Spirit. The church should do that. And we as followers of Jesus definitely should do that. So when we read a verse like that, we need to ask ourselves questions along these lines. Am I, me, am I, I've read it, am I growing in my ability to love? other people, people that are different than me? Am I seeking out joy? Because sometimes you got to fight to find joy. Am I seeking out, am I holding on to joy, or am I only focused on all the negatives? Because there's a lot of negatives to focus on, but when you only focus on the negatives, it robs you of any peace you might have. It robs you of any joy, and that is not how we're supposed to be living. Am I growing in patience? Can I be patient with those people that, yes, those people that, even those people that hurt me? That's hard. That's hard. Am I growing in humility? Am I growing in humility or is everything still about me? And am I still the center of my own universe? Am I growing in my ability to avoid sin? Do I still look at things I shouldn't? Do I control my anger? Do I think before I speak? See, here's the thing. Self-help books, they may ask similar questions, but all those psychologists and self-help books, they're missing the secret sauce. And it's God's secret sauce because growing in the knowledge of God is the only thing that allows us that type of transformation. And growing in the knowledge of God is allowing the Holy Spirit to change us so that we no longer live according to our desires. 
meaning that we have new desires. We're new people with new desires, and we no longer feel comfortable in this world. Too many of us feel too comfortable in this world. I'll change it. Too many of us feel too comfortable in this country. It should not shock you that our country does not look like what we want it to look like because we are different. God's kingdom is different. We should not be comfortable in this world. We should consider God in everything we think, everything we say, and everything we do. And I think it's fascinating. I think it's brilliant, even, how Peter ends his letter. There's something in the Bible yeah, let me pull back the curtain a little bit. There's something in the Bible when you study hermeneutics, which is the interpre- interpretation of Scripture, called an inclusio. An inclusio is when you start and end with the same thing. And it, this is very helpful for interpreting Scripture. Because when you start and end with the same thing, that's the point of the Scripture. There's no doubt what they're trying to say. And that's how Peter does. He ends his letter the same way he begins it. I think it's brilliant. In 2 Peter 1, 2, Peter begins by saying this, May grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He ends 2 Peter 3, 18 by saying, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see how it's the same thing? In 2 Peter 1, 3, Peter begins by acknowledging the God who called us by his own glory and goodness. He ends 2 Peter 3, 18 by saying, To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Saying the same thing. He's wrapping it up. It's coming full circle. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11, Peter begins by calling believers to what? To grow and change and mature in Christ so that, what? They will never be led astray by false teachers. And he ends right here in the same thing. 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18, he's doing the same thing. He's calling us grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, so that we are not led astray. That symmetry, that inclusio, is a perfect picture of the gospel. Because the gospel starts and ends at the same place, Jesus. The gospel began with Jesus' first coming, and it's going to end with Jesus' second coming. And those two advents, that's what you call it, Remember in Christmas time, Advent? That's the first Advent. There's a second Advent coming. Those two Advents have a lot in common, not the least of which is all the Scripture, all the prophecies that were fulfilled. But those two Advents are very different too. The first time Jesus came, he came as a suffering servant, and his mission was to die. Jesus' mission was to die to take away the sins of the world. But when Jesus comes again, he will not come as a suffering servant anymore. He will be coming as the reigning Lord and King of the universe. And his mission is not going to be to die. His mission is going to be to gather his children and cast out all the wicked and everybody that is not belong to him. Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we should live like that. Until he comes, he expects, he commands his followers, he commands us to talk like him and to walk like him and to live a life worthy of his arrival, to live a life that previews his reign. I know nobody goes to the movies anymore, but remember when you go to the movies, What happens before the movie? Well, first they try to sell you popcorn and gummy bears and all that stuff. Then they show you the trailers. And the trailers are these little previews of all the other movies they want you to come. The church is supposed to be a preview of the world to come. And I'm just being real. I think we, not Fort Lewis Baptist Church, we, the church, capital C, I think we've done a bad job of that recently. But it's not too late. Because Paul says in Colossians 3, If then you have been raised with Christ, 
Then seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above. Don't set your minds on things that are on earth. For you have died. We have died. And our life now, our new life, is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I can't even imagine what that will look like. But here's what I do know. This is the gospel. Second Peter tells us we need to remember it. We need to live it. Let's pray.